It was the powerful Hearst columnist Luella Parsons, maker and breaker of Hollywood reputations, who first suspected that Kane was a thinly disguised expose of her boss. She demanded a private screening. I ran the picture with Luella. This was quite an experience. Bob Wise and myself, Luella and her chauffeur were the audience for a running. And she left sometime toward the latter part of the picture in high dudgeon. And I remember the chauffeur stayed. And at the end of it, he said, very good picture. <laughs> she was outraged, just absolutely outraged. And of course, the result was all sorts of things. Telephone messages from Miss Parsons to RKO boss George Schaefer, still in the RKO archives, taken by switchboard operator Yvonne. 5.40 p.m., Luella Parsons called. She's asking for Mr. Schaefer's home number. Says it's a matter of life or death to RKO. 6 o'clock p.m., Miss Parsons called again. Said she would wait only five minutes for you to return her call. Says RKO is going to have, quote, the most beautiful lawsuit in history if it releases Citizen Kane. I had to get on a plane to go back to New York at RKO's uh, command to show the film at a, at a projection room at the music hall, uh, show the film to the top executives of all the picture companies, not the, not the vice presidents in charge of production on the coast, but the, the uh, Kents and the Scouras as the people who were the presidents and chairman of the board of all the major companies, uh, to show it to them and their lawyers. And the whole purpose of this was for them to determine, after seeing the film, these industry leaders, whether they would say to RKO, go ahead and release it, or RKO, in the interest of our business, for the well-being of our business, Put it on the shelf, don't release it. Hearst newspapers imposed a countrywide ban. Kane was not to be advertised nor even mentioned in any Hearst journal. The major cinema chains run scared, refuse to take the picture. Disaster at the box office. And worse, recriminations, strange allegations of revenge. Hearst, you see, uh, launched such an attack on us, particularly on me or his, his minions did. It was kind of, can no man rid me of this, and so on. And uh, I was once, well, th th this will get terribly long and anecdotal, but I'll try to tell it very quickly. Uh, I, I was lecturing in Buffalo. And after the lecture, I was with some people having dinner. And a waiter said, this policeman wants to see you. And I turned white. I always feel guilty when policemen want to see me. and. The, cop turned out to be very nice. He said, don't go back to your hotel room. I said, why? He said, they've got an underage girl undressed and photographers waiting for you. It's a setup. So I didn't go back to my room that night. I just stayed up, took the plane in the morning. But that was, that was as far as they were prepared to go. I would have gone to jail, of course. And they had the producers in Hollywood ready all together to pay RKO to burn the negative. It was nip and tuck, you know, whether the negative would be burnt, the picture never shown. Herman Mankiewicz's crime was regarded as even greater. He'd been a regular guest at William Randolph Hearst's lavish parties at his castle, San Simeon. Shortly after the Kane Hearst connection had leaked out, Mankiewicz was involved in a minor automobile accident. He scraped the side of another car, being driven by Mrs. Ira Gershwin. And the police made a routine report on it. And everybody went home. And then I guess about a week or two later, uh, some Hearst reporter saw the report on the police blotter in Beverly Hills. And so great was Hearst's power that they forced, forced a felony charge. Uh, and suddenly my father found himself charged with felony drunk driving and there were, the police said that he was abusive at the scene and, you know. So the word really had gone out from oh, Hearst yeah, to Hearst, get Mankiewicz. Get, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, no, Hearst, very vindictive man. The picture was about William Randolph Hearst, but the picture was also about Austin. And uh, a great deal of stuff in that picture uh, was taken not only from Hearst's life, but from Orson's childhood, from Orson's life, and certain characteristics of Cain were characteristics of Orson rather than William Randolph Hearst. I mean, the, uh, the great scene where he demolishes her dressing room 
uh, was definitely inspired by the great final scene of separation between Orson and me when he threw four flaming dish warmers at me. The same kind of wanton and insane destruction at the loss of something that he really felt very strongly about was used there, and that was true in many instances. <laughs> 